in transmission, when I talk on the telephone to someone, the signal that's passed through the phone to the receiver at the opposite end must be understandable and they must know who they're talking to. So the general parameter we use is, can the person who's listening know who they're talking to by the voice and also is the voice intelligible? We're going to look at the various parameters that make up the signal passing through the telephone line. If we were to take a small instant in time on a telephone line and look at the changes in the electrical signal, what we would see is as the voice was moving across the line, it would trace a waveform similar to this. This is a sine wave and it represents the change in voltage across that telephone line. The time between the peaks in the sine wave varies with the tone or pitch of the voice. We call the number of sine waves that occurs in one second the frequency. The higher the frequency, the higher the tone or pitch. The lower the frequency, the lower the tone or pitch. In addition, the height of the peaks from the positive peak here to the negative peak is the strength or loudness of the voice on the line. And we measure this in what's called amplitude, which is the measure of strength of the signal. Finally, there is a term called phase, which refers to the relationship of this sine wave to the next one. Phase does not count as much in voice transmission, but later on in data transmission, phase will be very important. Here in our laboratory, we've set up a piece of test equipment here that allows us to generate signals similar to what you see on a telephone line. Now with this device here, we can generate then individual frequencies or sine waves and put them down a telephone line and test it. Here on this side, we have what's called an oscilloscope. An oscilloscope is a piece of test equipment that enables us to pick out signals and display them. Now currently we're generating a sine wave at a frequency of 200 cycles per second and feeding them to the oscilloscope and we're picking out one cycle of that sine wave and displaying it. Now with this set we can take and change the characteristics of the sine wave and show you what all these terminology mean like amplitude, frequency, and decibels or power. Let's take a look at this sine wave and we'll vary it. If we take and increase the frequency of the sine wave, what will happen is we'll see more peaks. If we lower the frequency, we'll see less peaks. If we take and change the amplitude of the sine wave, it will get lower or higher. The sine wave itself on a telephone line is measured in what we call decibels. So we'll have higher decibels and lower decibel numbers to indicate what the power of the signal is. And finally, if you want to hear the signal, this is our 200 cycle per second sine wave. And as we increase the signal and frequency up to 2,000 hertz or 2 kilohertz, you can hear it's a much higher pitch tone and lower. So this gives a good example of what the signals look like that you'll see on a voice telephone line. If we were to take and make a chart of the frequencies the human voice could generate, we would see something like this. The human voice can generate frequencies in the range from about 15 cycles per second up to 9,000 cycles per second or 9 kilohertz, kilo being thousand and hertz being cycles per second. The human ear can detect frequencies that range from almost zero up to 18,000 cycles per second or 18 kilohertz. The wide range of frequencies that the ear can pick up and that the mouth can generate are important in things like singing or listening to music. 
In telephone communications, though, all we have is two people talking to one another normally. All we need to do is have enough range of frequencies passed by the telephone so that the two people know who they're talking to. So what we want to do is go back and look at the chart again and see what those range of frequencies would be. Studies have shown that if the range of frequencies in this area from about 300 hertz up to 3700 hertz are passed through the telephone, it generates enough range of frequencies to allow the listener to know who they're talking to. It's also been proven that this range of frequencies is the most commonly used by the human voice and where most of the power in the human voice exists. So this is where our area of perception is of the speaker's voice and characteristics. Now to understand which frequencies the telephone circuit will respond to, I want to show you something here about what we call loss and gain. For instance, if you're at a telephone here and your voice signal goes into the phone and we measure the amplitude or the size of it, at this end down here we take the measurement again of what the person hears. If the signal here is less than what was put in, we say that there was a loss in the network. If the signal is greater, we say there was a gain or the signal amplitude increased. What we'll do is we'll take and we'll put a series of frequencies into a telephone line at this end and then measure them at this end and plot the loss on a graph and it will show us what frequencies the telephone line will respond to and we'll refer to this as the band pass of a typical telephone circuit. Here is what the band pass of a telephone circuit looks like in the United States. Across the bottom we've made a scale which is in kilohertz or thousands of cycles per second. On the left side of the chart we measured the signal in what's called a decibel which is a measurement of power on the telephone line. Whenever we put a signal in one end and we get a gain we measure it in a positive or plus decibel. Whenever we put a signal in and we get a loss, we measure it in a negative decibel. Generally, end-to-end -end in a standard telephone circuit, everything will be either no loss or some loss. You will rarely get a gain on a telephone line. In our frequency ranges from 0 to 5 kilohertz, this would be the way the loss would be seen when it's graphed. The usable frequencies on the phone line are about from here, from about 300 to 3700 hertz. Anything beyond that, the loss is so great the signal is either unintelligible or it just can't be used. Now taking our band pass chart for the phone line, we make it into what's called an idealized curve. In other words, we exaggerate the curve here into a bell shape. We're going to work with this throughout the textbook from now on. Rather than using the true curve, we're just going to make an assumption that it falls along this particular range of frequencies with this loss. The other thing we want to find out is that this is what we call a C message curve. Now, as the telephone set was developed, its response to frequencies got better and better there was a letter associated with the type of telephone that was constructed. When they got up to what was called a type C telephone or a type C handset, the telephone companies decided that they would standardize on that particular range of frequencies that that handset responded to. So we refer to this as the C message curve. The importance of understanding the C message curve and the frequencies that the telephone line can pass are that we have a phone here that sends a signal down to a phone across the country or across town. We have to have standards that say if I put a signal in at this end I'm going to get a certain quality signal out at the opposite end. So the C message curve says the average loss for telephone lines in the United States meets this particular specification. That ensures that you can talk to someone in New York, 
San Francisco, Los Angeles, Dallas, or anywhere, and understand them and know who you're talking to. Finally, in transmission, we want to talk about some of the things that can adversely affect the signal going across the telephone line. Now, we looked at the frequency response chart, or the idealized C message curve, and we looked at a sine wave. What we can see happen is this sine wave can be changed, or the idealized frequencies can be changed, and in addition, noise can be induced into the telephone circuit, affecting what you hear at the opposite end. Noise is this background type things that you hear that sound like a crackling sound on the telephone line. And noise can be either continuous or what we call impulse noise, where it comes in and out on the line periodically. Also, we have what's called distortion. The actual shape of the sine wave can be distorted, or the frequencies that are put in at one end can be shifted and come out as different frequencies. And you're going to hear these terms when you're complaining about problems to the telephone company or your carrier. You're going to be telling them we've got impulse noise, we've got loss, or we've got distortion. There are terms that go even beyond these, but for the basic type of telecommunications person or analyst, those are the really the primary ones you need to know and understand. This concludes our subsection on transmission. What we've tried to explain to you here is that there are certain standards that allow a signal to be put in at one end of a telephone line and sent through and picked up at the opposite end and the person can be heard and understood. Now, we also talked about switching. Remember though, in the subsection on switching, that is strictly connecting the call up. In this subsection we completed it was how good is the signal and can we hear it at the opposite end of the network. Up to this point in our telephony course we've been looking at the telephone company out here and their switching equipment and transmission of signals. Now we want to talk about what goes on in your home, office, or other building with what we call the customer premise equipment the phones or the devices we call PBXs or key systems which we're going to define which reside in your office and are either owned by you or rented from someone by you and we're going to call this customer premise equipment the first piece of customer premise equipment we want to take a look at is the key telephone system now originally telephone systems were a single telephone set and a single line when you got into a small business environment, there were some problems because you had multiple telephone lines and multiple people needed to share them. So what they came up with was a simplified system where all the lines appeared on all the sets and there were buttons that you could use to select which line you wanted to talk on. And of course the lights flashed to tell you which one was ringing or which one was on hold. Let's take a look at how a key telephone set is put together. With a key telephone system, lines are brought in from the telephone company into the key telephone system itself. This is usually located in a closet or room off of the office area. There's a cross-connect system that allows different lines to be connected to different phones. You can use special phones called key telephone sets which have the buttons on them that flash and have hold and various functions or you can use plain single line sets. The cross connects here are hardwire connections that determine which telephone lines appear on which telephone sets. They also control which sets ring on those lines and which ones just flash the lights and do not ring. The key telephone systems are more or less what we call square systems. So many lines in, so many stations out. Also, on the key telephone system, lines come in and ring on specific sets or telephones. The problem with the key telephone system is if you went to a large company, you couldn't use that type of arrangement. You have to have some way where calls come in, go through a central point, and then are distributed to many hundreds of telephones. What happened next was the PBX was used to solve this problem. In the PBX, you have a central system, which is a miniature telephone company central office. 
And if you remember, we called the telephone company system a central exchange sometimes. Well, the PBX stands for Private Branch Exchange. It's a private exchange on your premises. Calls come in through what we call trunks. An operator intercepts the call and then distributes them out to telephones we call extensions or stations. The PBX itself is a small branch exchange similar to the telephone company switching system. Calls come into the PBX from the outside world through what are called CO trunks or central office trunks. Calls come in, an operator intercepts the call and then sends it out to a telephone called either an extension or a station. The PBX can have a variety of different features besides just extensions and central office trunks. One of the things you'll see is tie lines. If you have two PBXs in separate buildings, you can have a line connecting them that you can dial numbers between the PBXs. These are called tie lines. They connect two PBXs together. To go into some of the differences between PBXs and key telephone systems, the first and main difference is the size most key telephone systems are used in small offices. We're talking 10 to 15 people. PBXs start at about 50 lines or extensions and go up to sizes of 10,000 and more lines. In the key system, calls generally come in and ring on a specific station. If someone needs to talk on that line, the call usually cannot be transferred. The person who needs to talk on that line has to be able to push a button down that has that what we call appearance on that set. In a PBX system, calls can be transferred to any station usually, and stations can talk to one another. In a key telephone system, stations can only talk to one another if they have a special intercom line. Looking at a basic PBX system, what we see is that the PBX has the capability of talking to the outside world, and it has the capability of talking to its extensions. Now, if you take later courses from the Information Factory, you're going to learn about in-depth type of PBX selection and design. But there is a basic way to know if a PBX is going to do the job for you, and we have what we call our one-minute PBX course. Every PBX must have these three basic functions. And modern PBXs have things like station transfer, call waiting, call hold, everything else. But if you don't have all three of these basic functions, it's not a PBX. It must be able to receive calls from the outside world. In other words, if you can't get calls from your customers to place orders and things, it's not doing the job. You must be able to place calls to the outside world or make outside calls. So you have to be able to pick up your phone and call outside. And you must be able to call from station to station. If you're in a large business where you can't run through 10 floors to talk to someone, you need that capability. If the PBX doesn't have these three functions, it's not really a PBX in doing its job. In some cases, you may see a PBX system with multiple lines going into a key telephone system serving the telephones in a department. For instance, a secretarial position may have the lines for answering and placing on hold so other people can pick them up. So remember the key system can be behind the PBX and be part of a common system. To summarize our introduction to customer premise equipment, we showed you the types of systems that are usually used in offices such as key telephone systems and PBXs. We also introduced you to some of the terminology, such as the key telephone set, an extension or station line on a PBX, and central office trunks, and finally tie lines. Now, remember that all of these systems you'll see in offices nowadays are outgrowths of either a basic key telephone system or a PBX. Our final subsection in section two of this course deals with telephone company services and offerings. What we're going to do is give you just an introduction to some of the basic types of services you can buy. 
Now you've seen the equipment, you know how the telephone company network works, but what is it you actually go out and buy from the phone company? That's what we're going to show you next. When the telephone companies in the United States were deregulated, the Federal Communications Commission divided them up into geographic zones called LADAs, or Local Access Transport Areas. Within the LADA, the local telephone company provides all the services. You not only get your single phone line from the phone company, but if you place a call from someone within the LADA to another person within that same LADA, it's carried by the local telephone company. If you wanted to place a call from your phone to someone that's in another LADA across country, that call is handled through a common carrier such as ATT, MCI, Sprint, or any of the other competing long distance carriers. Within the LADA, the long distance carriers have a central office that they call a POP, or point of presence. When you dial a long distance number, your phone company connects you to their point of presence. The call is routed across country to the point of presence for that carrier in the other ladder, and then passed into the local phone company, and the phone rings for the person you're calling. This is important to remember. Within the ladder, all the services belong to the local phone company. When you leave the ladder, that's where competing services such as ATT, MCI, or Sprint are available. The state of California is divided up into 10 LADAs, or local access transport areas. Each of the LADAs has one or more operating telephone companies. Within the LADA, any services that are required are provided only by the physical phone company in that area. If, however, you use a service such as long distance dialing between, say, San Francisco and Sacramento, you could use one of the competing long distance carriers such as MCI, Sprint, or AT&T. If, however, you were to call from San Francisco to San Jose, which is in the same ladder, that call would have to be carried by Pacific Telephone Company or General Telephone Company, one of the local telephone companies, and could not be carried by one of the competing carriers. The simplest type of telephone service is what we call POTS, P-O-T-S, plain old telephone service. This would consist of a single telephone with a telephone line back to the central office, and you would do your dialing through either pulse or tone signaling on the line. This line back to the central office would also carry the standard voice frequencies in what we would call an analog type transmission. So this is POTS, or plain old telephone service. Let's detail some of the features of POTS. Plain old telephone service, as we call it, usually consists of a single line. That line has either tone, which is what we sometimes refer to as the push button dialing, or pulse dialing, which is our rotary dial. It's capable of having both in and out calling so you can make phone calls or receive phone calls, and it has measured usage. Now there are still in some areas of the country some unlimited type telephone services available, but in most cases all telephone systems are going over to measured usage, which means when you lift up the phone and you place a call, the call is charged to you based on how far the call has gone and how long you talk. Finally, there is what we call the 1MB or the business line. The MB stands for Measured Business Line, and this is the type of POTS or plain old telephone service you would put in a small business with just a single line phone in. In most states, there's a difference between a regular residence telephone single line and a business line, in that with the business line you can get your yellow pages advertising and things like that. With your plain old telephone service in your LADA, you're allowed to make calls within the LADA. Now, however, when you want to call outside to the other LADA, you must subscribe to one of the common carriers. And the major ones are ATT, MCI, Sprint. There are other carriers available. Some of them are nationwide and some are regional. What you do is when you order your telephone here, you tell your local telephone company 
which of the common carriers you're going to use. Whenever you dial a telephone number that's outside the ladder, your phone company automatically routes the call to the POP or point of presence. It's carried by your carrier to the other ladder and connected to that phone company. You must remember now that under the present system, your phone only allows you calling within the ladder and you must subscribe to a long distance carrier to get calls between the ladders or over the ladder boundaries. You can in some cases subscribe to more than one long distance carrier. Now when you do this you designate a primary carrier and secondary carriers. Now the long distance carriers are also called OCCs or other common carriers. Each OCC has a three digit number that is unique and identifies it anywhere in the United States. With more than one carrier assigned to your telephone, whenever you dial a long distance number, the call will automatically go to your primary carrier. If you have a secondary carrier, then what happens is you dial one zero followed by the three digit code that designates that OCC. For instance, a 222 designates MCI and 288 designates AT&T. So if MCI was your secondary carrier, you would dial 10222, then the long distance number, and that call would be routed via MCI. The reason for having more than one carrier is if you're a small business and you do a lot of long distance calling, you can use a long distance carrier within your state that may be cheaper and then a long distance carrier for interstate calls that may have better rates in that zone. In our subsection on switching we looked at this drawing and explained how calls are billed according to the distance between the central offices so that a call from this person to this person would not be in the 10 to 15 mile range but would be in the 15 to 20 mile range because that's where the central office is located. This billing based on the central office locations is the way all telephone calls are billed. Local calls are billed based upon the local carrier in the latter and their CO locations. Long distance calls are billed based on the mileage between the POPs or point of presence of the long distance carriers. Let's take a look at how we know what the mileage is between the central offices. In order to figure out the mileage for billing purposes, what happens is laid over the North American continent, there is a grid called the vertical and horizontal coordinates. This grid is set up by the FCC or the Federal Communications Commission. It's based on one third mile increments. What happens is whenever a central office or in the case of an other common carrier, a POP is opened, the physical location of that office is registered with the FCC based on its position on the vertical and horizontal points on the grid. Here's a case where we show you two central offices, the 9461 in area code 408 and the 861 exchange in area code 415. This is their position vertically and horizontally on this one-third mile increment grid. Now in your textbook is an example of how you take these positions and you can compute the mileage between these two central offices. Now no matter how the call is routed, the charging of the call will always be based on the direct airline mileage between these two points as computed using the vertical and horizontal coordinates. The next service we want to look at is what's called WATS or Wide Area Telephone Service. Basic telephone services with long distance and things are billed on a per minute rate. Sometimes if you're a large business doing a lot of telephone calling, you need a way to get a discount in your telephone service. The first type of service that came along that offered a discount was just the Watts service available from AT&T. And the Watts service, effectively, you lost some of the features of a basic telephone, but you gained by getting a discount for making a large volume of calls. 
Now, watch services, because they take things away, you have some problems, such as in some watch services, you can only make calls outside of the state you're in. In some cases, you can only receive incoming calls on the watts line, what they call in watts. There are also separate watts lines for calling within the state, and then watts lines for calling within a LATA. And you have to go to a different carrier to get each different kind of watts service. Let's take a look at the interstate watts service and see how it's billed. If you are going to buy an interstate watts line for outward calling, you would have to select what are called bands or areas you are going to call into. Now in the case of, say, AT&T's watts service, their outbound watts divides the United States into five bands. And band one, which is the closest to where your office is, would allow you to call outside of California in this case, but up to the edge of band one. If you bought a watts line that went to band four or five, you would get everything up to and including that band. So the watts lines, the bands, move outward, and you buy to the furthest band you want, and you get everything before it. Watts service, because it is bulk telephone build, what you have is limitations. So in other words, you're getting cheaper phone service, but there are limitations over your regular phone service. And some of these limitations are separate lines are required. For instance, if you have in watts, the 800 type service, and out watts for cheaper calling out of your company, they're on separate telephone lines. Now, this may not mean much to you right now, but when you study traffic engineering, you'll see when you have separate trunk groups, it takes more lines to handle the same amount of traffic. Interstate and intrastate take separate lines. Intralata takes a separate group of lines. Watts is bulk billing, which means at the end of the month, you get a bill that tells how many hours you used, but there's no detail to tell you where you called, or there's no detail to tell where the calls came from if it's in 800 in service. Also, the bands are by location. So the chart we looked at earlier was for California with bands one through five moving eastward across the country. If you were in Chicago, the bands move in circles out from Chicago. And band five for Chicago would be the east and west coast. Now some of this is changing with competition. For instance, interstate and intrastate are being combined into single lines by some of the carriers. Also, bulk billing can be done away with and you can get detailed billing for an extra charge. So all of these are the present limitations, but some of them are going away with the newer carriers. Another example of a telephone company service is what's called foreign exchange. If you owned a business in San Francisco and advertised throughout California, you may get customers calling you from San Jose as an example. For them to call you would be a toll call. The phone company has a service where they would allow you to buy a telephone number off of a central office in San Jose. That telephone number would be wired up to your central office and ring on a phone in your office. So that a San Jose caller would place a local call, but the phone would actually ring in San Francisco. In this way, if you were a small company such as a plumbing contractor or something, the person in San Jose would think they were calling a local company, where in reality the phone would be ringing at your office. Foreign exchange is charged based on the cost of a leased or private line that would be connected from the remote central office to the telephone in your business office. Another example of a telephone company service is private lines. In this particular case, we're showing where two PBXs in separate cities normally would place calls through the telephone company. Because the calls were being placed as normal through telephone company calls, they would be billed at the per minute rate based on the distance called. If you did a great deal of calling between these two locations, 
you could put in a tie line, which is a private line offering from the phone company that ties two PBXs together. Now the users would place their call over the tie line between the PBXs. Now instead of paying for your service on a per minute basis, you would pay a flat monthly rate for this tie line based on the mileage. One thing we want to clarify on all the special services was the method of billing. Now, as you noticed, private lines, we said, were billed on a flat monthly rate. It's true they're based on mileage, but it's still the same rate every month regardless of how much you use them. Other services, such as Watts and basic telephone service, are billed based on measured usage. In other words, how long you stay on the phone and how long the call is placed in mileage. What you usually do is you play these services off against one another to achieve cost savings. For instance, we had the case of the two PBXs where the calls between them were exceeding a certain dollar amount, so we put a tie line in. What we hope is that the tie line at a flat monthly rate will save us money on calling between the two locations. So the reason for all the different special services is not only to provide different offerings, but to allow you to save money by trading the services off against one another. This now concludes our subsection on telephone company services and offerings. Now in this subsection we took a look at various services such as the POT service or plain old telephone service, which would be a line into a home or a very small business. We talked a little bit about the 1MB or the measured business line, which was for a small business or service. We also talked about Watts, the wide area telephone service, which is a bulk discount method of getting your long distance calling. And we talked about foreign exchange. This was given as an example of a highly specialized type of service where you could have a telephone from another city ring in your office or small business. And we talked about private line services. These were the flat rate monthly services that you could use to replace one of these and save your company money. Now, in reality, the telephone company offerings and services go on for many pages. All we did was give you a small sampling so that you could better understand those services when you have to study them in later courses. This concludes section two of our telecommunications course. In this section, you studied telephony. We talked about how the telephone works, switching, customer premise equipment, transmission, and telephone company services and offerings. This was intended to be an introductory or overview. Later courses will cover these various subjects in depth. What I'd like you to do now is turn to the back of section two and go down through the terminology to review and remember, and then proceed on and do the quizzes in the back. If you did not understand the section, go back through the book and follow along with the videotape at the same time. Following are the terms to review for section two. Alternate routing, amplitude, area code, automatic switching, bandwidth, C message, central office, central office trunks, Common Control, Cradle, Crossbar, Decibel, Dial, Dial Register, Direct Distance Dialing, Drop, Electronic Switching, Equal Access, Exchange, Extension, Foreign Exchange, Frequency, Frequency Response, Gain, Handset, Hertz, Impulse Noise, Key Telephone System, Kilohertz, KTS, LATA, Line Finder, Local Loop, Loss, Microphone, Network, OCC, PABX, Phase, Primary Routing, Pulse Dial, POP, POTS, Private Line, Receiver, Routing, Station, Stepper, Subscriber, Switch Hook, Switching, Telephone, Telephony, Tie Line, Toll Office, Tone Dialing, Transmission, Transmitter, 
trunk, V&H coordinates, watts, and white noise.